running helped me stay vertical is the way I like to put it. It helped me uh, get up in the morning and have a plan every morning and it helped me deal with grief. And I fell in love with it to the point where I thought, I wonder what age I'm gonna have to stop this. And I tell people, you know, I thought maybe at a certain age I would have to give up running and take up something like Pinochle. And I've since found out that Pinochle is a card game, so. Welcome to Zestful Aging, where I talk with fascinating, talented, and influential guests who reflect on the adventures and challenges of aging and who are living their lives with vibrance and purpose. I'm your host, Nicole Christina, psychotherapist, writer, and Zestful Ager. And if you like this podcast, you'll love my companion course, Zestful Aging, Simple and Sustainable Habits for Health and Longevity. You'll have access to what I've learned from being a psychotherapist for 30 years and the latest research on what habits really matter and contribute to vibrant aging. Find out more at NicoleChristina.com. Last week, we spoke with Judy Butler, who's a pastoral counselor, and she helps adult children of aging parents with a comprehensive system that she created called The Guardian's Gift. It's a really interesting interview, and she knows what she's talking about because she has gone through some of the stressors of helping her own uh, aging parents. And next week, we're going to be speaking with Action Nan. She's a 72-year-old innkeeper in Cornwall, UK, who has dedicated her life to eliminating single-use plastic. And she spends her weekends cleaning up beaches. She's vowed to clean up a beach every single weekend in the entire year. And you will find her with her tribe of litter pickers on the beaches. She is something else. You will really enjoy this interview. Well, I have my Jack Russell Terrier Sparky beside me, my coffee in my hand. So let's begin. Today, we're going to be speaking with Liz Bassey, a two-time Emmy-nominated actor who joined the cast of All My Children at the age of 16 and has since appeared on 12 television shows, including CSI, ER, and Two and a Half Men. Her directorial debut, The Human Race, focuses on how to maintain and even increase our health as we age, specifically through running. She profiles older runners and follows them through their training and their events. Welcome to the show, Liz. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks. Um, I'm wondering if we could just start with the obvious question, which is, you know, you've had a lot of experience in acting and entertainment. And I'm just wondering about why you decided to make a film about running, particularly for older people. Well, there were a couple different reasons, and it it stemmed from uh, my mother passing away in 2012. Um, It was a really difficult time, obviously, and uh, running helped me stay vertical is the way I like to put it. It helped me uh, get up in the morning and have a plan every morning, and it helped me deal with grief. And I fell in love with it to the point where I thought... I wonder what age I'm going to have to stop this. And I tell people, you know, I thought maybe at a certain age I would have to give up running and take up something like Pinochle. And I've since found out that Pinochle is a card game. So Uh so that doesn't doesn't really make a lot of sense. I thought it was like (laughs) shuffleboard on a cruise ship or something. But um, I found out also that uh, I don't have to give it up. I I found out that runners, um, sometimes people in marathons are 60, 70, 80, 90. People can run at all different ages. And I was thrilled to read that for personal reasons. And I also thought that uh, I always say that I come from LA where the ageism is made. And Mm. I thought, wow, I have an opportunity here to show people past a certain age doing extraordinary things. And if I'm surprised and delighted by this, I'm assuming that other people will be too. Mm -hmm. So you had been a runner, you liked it, but then it became almost like you say kept you vertical. It sounds like it was one of the anchors in your life. It absolutely was. It was meditation for me. Mm -hmm. Um, and, And interestingly enough, you know, I... 
uh, spoke to a grief counselor after my mom passed away. And one of the first questions she asked was, are you doing physical activity? So it was fascinating to me because it really does change your mood. And for me, it helped me sort through a lot of feelings. It also, there's something wonderful about expending that much energy and just uh, feeling in a weird way, you're actually energized at the end of a long run and you're also exhausted. And I know those sound, it sounds like a dichotomy, but it's a little bit of both. And, and um, it just became, it became very important to me and also just a way to get out and, and see nature and uh, see the world around me. And it did a lot to lift my spirits. Mm -hmm. So you were working in Hollywood and LA um, as you're going through this process. Yeah, I was. Well, uh, my mom was at Emory Hospital in Atlanta, so I was flying back and forth. And mm -hmm. my husband's a steady cam operator, and he was actually shooting a movie in Atlanta at the time. So uh, he had an apartment that was 15 minutes away from my mother's hospital. Uh, mm -hmm. So I would fly back and forth. But um, yeah, every morning I was either running in Atlanta or running in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And I really, I wanted people to see and this is really heavily discussed in my documentary, pretty much every runner I met, we all have a why. Uh, mm -hmm. there, there is a why as to why we want to get up every morning and run. And a lot of it is not what you would expect. What do you mean by that? Well, I have one runner uh, who's 57, and he started running because his son is autistic. And his son was trying to get involved in a sport, and nothing was sticking. And finally, his son fell in love with running. Mm -hmm. And this runner in my documentary was so concerned that his son was going to get lost running around in the hills above his home that he started running with his son and he fell uh -huh. in love with it and it became a bonding experience for the two of them. So the reason he runs is family and uh, several of my other runners, you know, loneliness is a big problem. Um, I, I read a statistic that over 42 million people in America suffer from chronic loneliness. Mm -hmm. And several of the people I met, their reason for running is for social reasons. They get out and run with a club. And mm -hmm. so five mornings a week, they're running with 12, 15, 20 other people. Oh, and it's boy. their social life. And that's the gold, right? We know that from the aging research that social connections are so very important. Oh, yeah. And just and it was really funny, too, because these <laughs> the people that, that were doing this, they're from a group called Run Tampa in Tampa, Florida. Mm -hmm. And they're like teenagers. I mean, these are people <laughs> who are 60, 70 and 80 and they're running together and they're gossiping like teenagers and they're they're, t they're making plans for the next race. And oh, it's so gosh. thrilling to see a 70 year old look at me straight in the eye and say, well, I'm doing a 10K in Tampa next week, which is going to conflict with a half marathon that I I want oh, to run in Fort Lauderdale. Gosh. And it, it was just, it was a beautiful thing to see. I was incredibly inspired by it, all of my runners. They had a great hashtag at the National Senior Games that you may have heard. Um, I, I don't know if Kat, Catherine Switzer told you this, but it was called Real Senior Moments. Yes. And I love that. It's like, yeah. I love the irony there. And it sounds like that would have been a great time for that hashtag when you're talking to the 70 year old woman and she's, you know, she's trying to figure out how she can fit all her races in. Yep, absolutely. That's a great hashtag. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're running, you're, you're knowing it's vitally important for you, you're commuting, you're working, it sounds like you're holding your life together. When does it dawn on you that, wait a minute, I want to make a documentary? You know, have you ever heard the story about the frog in the boiling water? How the, the frog yes. can step in water and they turn the water <laughs> Just up? Just go slowly. And then uh, eventually the water <laughs> the water's boiling and the frog says, oh my God, I'm in boiling water. <laughs> I, I thought... I thought, well, maybe I'll make a documentary. I'm married to a camera operator. I've always wanted to direct. And uh, I know it would be a really worthwhile way to spend my time. And I thought, well, maybe I'll start it someday. And, and that's a dangerous word. Um, and because someday can always get pushed and pushed and pushed. And then I started putting the word out to older runners. I just sort of put it on social media. And I didn't have to work very hard for these runners to come to oh. me. And what was interesting is I realized this is a great thing to do because these people want to be seen. And ah. I feel that a lot of people past a certain age are either underrepresented or misrepresented in our culture and in the media. And I thought, 
wow, this is going to be important. And my first runner who reached out and there was a, a time constraint was Helene Neville. And um, mm. she's the woman who ran across every state in America mm. and, and was spreading the word about how to rethink impossible. She's survived cancer and she is an extraordinary woman. And she reached out to me and she said, if you want to follow me, I'm running all the states in the middle, but you have to come to my training facility in two weeks. Mm, and I oh. said, okay. So uh, <laughs> before I knew it, it I was making a documentary. And, um, ah. and then I was getting questions from people. Like I was trying to find an editor and get that all set up. And the editor was asking me questions about, well, how long is your, your plan for post-production? And I thought, <laughs> well, I, I know that in, in scripted television, it takes a couple months. So I said, maybe two months. And she laughed. Oh. And I said, what? And she said, it takes eight months to edit a documentary. So it was a, it was a huge learning curve for me. But mm -hmm. I'm, I'm proud of myself for doing it. And I'm thrilled that it came out the way that it did. Aha. Uh -huh. and, and so... This is something, you know, it's not like a little side project, right? I mean, did you have to turn down other roles um, to devote all of your attention to this? Or how did you juggle the rest of your working life? I have no idea. I look at last <laughs> year and I spent pretty much every day in editing with my editor. And I also... Um, it was, it was kind of interesting because I also sold, I'm not really acting anymore. I'm writing more than anything else. Mm -hmm. And I sold a script to Netflix and I sold a script to the CW. So I was doing that and I was training for my first marathon. So I was oh, doing wow. all of this at the same time. And I think somehow if you have that much on your plate, somehow time sort of expands in a certain way. You find mm -hmm. the time. I'm not sure where. I didn't get a lot of sleep, but mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it was a pretty thrilling year. And your husband was also collaborating in terms of his uh, technical work? Yeah, he is a camera operator. And so he was my director of photography. And it was pretty amazing because we traveled all around the country. I'm, I'm thinking of the credit sequence in my doc. And I think we visited 12 to 15 different places flying around after these people and uh you know it's a great marriage when your husband will come along with you and go to a tiny town in colorado at nine thousand feet to uh -huh. follow a runner for 48 hours in a race that goes up to fourteen thousand feet and we right. slept in the car and um oh, it, it was we're it's still like married. an adventure <laughs> yeah we're still married and we still love each other so oh, you know wow, something wow. worked <laughs> well, was there anything particular that, I mean, I know it's all fabulous and, and, and inspiring and all of that, but was there, are there any moments that you'll never forget as you uh, look back on making this documentary? Um, several. I mean, you know, on both sides of the spectrum. On the one side, it's harder than I've ever worked in my entire life. And I luckily got a distributor. Um, it's available in 26 different places now because of this distributor. Wow. But they called me and they sent me a list literally longer than my arm of things they needed before they could distribute the film. I didn't know what half of them were because I've been writing my entire life. I've been acting my entire life. I don't know about errors and omission insurance. At first, I thought they said Arizona mission insurance. And I thought, well, we only shot one scene in Arizona. I don't even know. What are they, you know, what I, are they talking I, about? I had And do no, they play I, pinochle there? They totally, they play a lot of pinochle in Arizona. So I, I thought, I, you know, all of it was so much of a, of a learning curve, like oh. I said. So I will definitely remember that, um, you know, just how much I had to learn and take in very quickly. On the other end of the spectrum, I got to meet Catherine Switzer, who has mm. been, um, you know, to be perfectly honest, I thought maybe she'd narrate the thing. I, I wrote her and I thought maybe she would just provide her voice. And she said, uh, actually, you know, if you want me to be one of your runners, I'm running the oh. New York City Marathon. If you'd like to come and watch me train. Oh, and I said, gosh. yeah, I think I'd kind of like that. And I, as much as I possibly could have hoped to like that woman, I liked mm. her a hundred times more. Mm -hmm. I just adore her. And she's got such a vivacious, I mean, I don't know her as well as you do. I just had the honor of interviewing her, but, and what a sense of humor. Oh, she's great. She's, she's funny and body and tough and sweet yeah. and everything all at once. And mm. so one of the main moments that I remember when she finished the New York City Marathon in 2017, when I, sh when I was shooting the footage, I was waiting for her at the finish line and mm. she came up and I hugged her. 
Now, last year, I ran my first marathon. My husband got dragged into it with me. And when we finished, she was waiting for us and she hugged us. Oh, my god! And it was one of those moments. That picture means so much to me. Oh, so. my gosh. There's so much there. I mean, so much, I would imagine, meaning in terms of her being the first woman to run the Boston Marathon. And then now... You've made a document. I mean, it's there's so many circles within circles. Yeah, it was it was thrilling. So that was one of the best moments of the entire experience was mm. getting to have it come full circle round. Um, and by the way, marathons are tough. I, mm. I had I I. It's so funny. Everybody said, "Are you bitten? Do you want to keep running them?" And I said, "You know, I'm really not sure. I love running every day, but 26.2. I, mm. I I that's a that's a long distance." Mm. Yeah, <laughs> that is a long way to go. And we talk about that in the documentary too. Not everybody has to be a marathon runner. It's not mm -hmm. my intention with this documentary at all. We show one man running his first 5k, a uh, couple women running their first 10k, a couple people running uh, half marathons. It, it can be any distance. It's about getting up and doing something. It's not mm -hmm. about how far you run. It's just about running or doing whatever it is that speaks to you. Yeah, as long as it's moving and get, keeping the body limber. Yes, yes. And, and we also wanted to combat the, the narrative, and it's a fictitious narrative, that running is bad for you. Um, one of the doctors that we talked to was from Stanford, mm -hmm. and he did a 20-year longitudinal study about uh, runners, 500 runners versus 500 non-runners. And he found out that if you're running on the right type of surface, if you're wearing the correct socks and the correct shoes, if you don't have a pre-existing condition, if you're taking care of yourself and you're, you're running and you're smart and you listen mm -hmm. to pain messages that your body's giving you, that in actuality, you'll end up healthier and your knees will be stronger and your ligaments will be stronger. And so his studies were sort of revolutionary. And I wanted to get that out there because a lot of times when I say that I run, um, I mean, I also bicycle. I do, I do a lot of things, but I went on a streak. I ran for a very long time every day. And he had said to me, is your body in pain? I said, no, not at all. He said, keep running. And mm -hmm. it's funny because when I tell people I run, the first question is, how are your knees? And mm -hmm. I always say, probably stronger than yours because I do this. Mm -hmm. So um, it was kind of exciting to get to talk about that too and, and put that out there that, uh, that it's, it's healthier than some people think. Hey, Zestful Agers. Last year, I attended the International Federation on Aging's Global Conference in Toronto, and they've announced the 15th Global Conference on Aging for Niagara Falls, Ontario, from November 1st through 3rd, 2020. Zestful Aging Podcast is a proud partner for this conference, and I encourage you to all consider attending. The conference features prominent experts presenting and discussing critical issues within the field of aging. So head on over to ifa2020.org to learn more. And I hope to see you in Niagara Falls in November. Were you, um, was there any part of the documentary that you uh, feel like you, you might have uh, added, but... You had to, you know, people talk about, oh, it ended up on the cutting room floor. Did you have to make hard decisions about what to keep and 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 just be mindful about how long it was? It took eight months to edit it, and it was something we were mindful of all the time. I mean, normally documentaries run about 90 minutes, and I could have easily had a three-hour movie with everything that I got. Um, okay. Because these people were just fascinating. And mm. I think the part that I had to cut that broke my heart the most was a lot of the families. Um, I'd been able to speak to grandkids and to husbands and wives, and it was just, I had to make sort of a unilateral decision that it, that was gonna have to be lifted and I was gonna have to focus on the runners specifically and what it meant to them and watching them on their journey, or I was gonna have a three hour movie. So um, I have a lot <laughs> of footage. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, a part two, I, that, that has definitely been discussed. So. Is that <laughs> something it. that you've been thinking about, the yeah. next the next documentary? You know, I, I personally, I 
was thinking about it. Uh, well, after I finished the first one, I thought, well, that is done. And then I guess it's like <laughs> childbirth because then yeah. you start thinking, what do I do next? Yes. And um, I immediately, I have a, a big problem with gender bias. And so I thought, you know, maybe I'll do something on gender bias and I'll meet women who do things that are predominantly done by men, uh, jobs, ah. sports. And then I, I was thinking about that seriously. And then suddenly more older runners have started approaching me saying, yeah, but if you do a part two, I'd like to be in it. Oh, so uh, wow. I'm, I'm weighing that because I, I know a lot of people, like I said before, they want to be seen and I want to help them be seen. And the response to this one has been great. It's been humbling and wonderful and uh, mm. inspirational for me to be able to see that it's, it's, it's having an impact. And um, so maybe I will do another one. <laughs> I don't it's know. It's interesting. I, um, I'm aware, uh, just from uh, somebody was talking about that the welding trade is really seeking out women now and holding weekend welding trainings to get women to either switch careers or consider welding as their primary career right out of I guess they're schooling. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I was just thinking that certainly is a non-traditional um, activity for women. Yeah. But it's, it's on, yeah, it's on the radar now. Yeah, car mechanics too. There's a, there's ah. a garage that's run completely by women. And the woman uh -huh. that started it said that she wanted to do it. She, I, I was reading about her. I haven't met her yet. But she was saying that she started it because she hated being in fear every time her engine light came mm. on. And right. that she decided she wanted to figure out how to do it herself. So she quit her other job, became a mechanic, and opened up a garage with uh, all female mechanics. And I, I love that. Yeah, I do too. I think it's pretty fascinating. So so we'll see. <laughs> we'll right. see. You have, uh, it sounds like you're still a little bit in the resting phase. And then um, we'll see what happens to the frog in the water. Well, yeah. You know, it's a strange thing in this business too because you sell scripts and then there's a a wide birth of time between when you sell a script and when you find out if it's going to series. And if it goes to series, then suddenly you're completely ensconced in that and you're running the television show. And so I have a lot of plates that I'm spinning right now as far as writing and going out and I have a pitch next week. I, I just pitched something recently that went very well. So um, I've been really concentrated on that. But I do think there's another documentary in my future at some point because it was it was a great experience. Do you think that your writing has been impacted by your mom's death and your experience grieving that? That's a great question. Uh, yes, I do. Um, I do. I think in a couple different ways it has been. Um, first of all, writing was another thing that meant a lot to me uh, in the aftermath of her death. Like I, I had sold a script and I wrote it so quickly and then I wrote another script and then it, it helped me. I just kept thinking, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, like mm -hmm. from, from Finding Nemo. So there was that. It let me escape into my head and go into these imaginary worlds where I could, uh, you know, where I could actually dictate what happens. You know, when you when you don't get to dictate what happens in real life, sometimes sitting down and writing can be very cathartic because you get to make the, the ending, you know, you get to do mm -hmm. it the way you want to do it. And mm -hmm. so in that way, yes. And also I found that there is, uh, you know, a little strand of, uh, I deal, I deal with grief a lot in the things that I write because I said to my husband when I was going through the process myself, I said, it's as if, it's as if to me, grief doesn't have the dignity to be linear. I had always thought that, and this was, you know, I'd never gone through anything like this in my life. I thought, okay, so there are a couple different steps, and I know there'll be uh, anger and bargaining, and you know, oh, I read like the book. Oh, like the Kubler Ross. Yeah, and I yeah. thought, well, once you check off the step, aren't you done? And uh -huh. no, you're not. Uh -huh. And and the waves keep on coming, and it's just mm -hmm. a matter of learning how to surf them and realizing that you're going to be dealing with it the rest of your life, and it's a part of you, and um, you carry it with you, and it has made me far more empathetic to people who have gone through their own losses. Um, people reached out to me after it happened. And now I see old friends who are going through it themselves. And I immediately reach out to them, um, you know, through social media, like I'll message them privately, or I'll reach out and, and call and we'll, we'll talk about it. Because I think, you know, I, I want to pass on what people did for me. So mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it's uh it sounds like it was an experience that was both painful and enriching. 
Uh, it was it was very painful, but she's with me every day. You know, my mm -hmm. I uh, I started acting when I was nine, and we bonded. She was the anti stage mother. She always told me if it wasn't, <laughs> she really was. She was like, if it's not fun, stop. And if you don't get a role, you need to understand that it's because you don't fit the right piece of the puzzle. It is not personal. And these were important lessons. And she taught me from a very young age. You know, it ain't all about you, kid. So, like, you know, <laughs> there are people on the crew, there are writers, there are directors. It is a group activity, and it needs to be treated like a group activity. And you, if you must never get an ego about this. And wow. all of those things have served me really well. And um, I think, I think she'd be very proud of this documentary. I think, although. <laughs> She, I bet. <laughs> she hated exercise, so it's kind of <laughs> funny. Like, hated it. I put her on a program um, years before she passed away of, of just doing the, the Stairmaster or the elliptical for 20 minutes three or four times a week. Absolutely hated wow. it. But That's she something. did it. You know, she, she did. did. It. Yeah, she did. Was it. she also in the business? Uh, no. She, um, mm -hmm. she worked for a consulting group in Atlanta. And mm -hmm. um, she loved the business. But at one point, she came to visit me in Florida when I was doing a TV show. And I was playing a lawyer. And I said, hey, mom, you want to be atmosphere? You want to be an extra? She mm. said, yeah, I'll be an extra. So I put her behind me. You know, we, we put her in like a prime place where her face would be seen right behind me as I'm defending a fake case, playing a fake lawyer. And um, they yelled, cut. And then my mom got up. And I said, what are you doing, ma? She goes, well, I'm done. And I said, you're not done. We have to do like four more takes from this angle. Then we have to do my close up your elbows in the shot. And she, I saw it <laughs> dawn on her. She was like, this is perhaps the most boring thing I've ever done in my entire <laughs> life. So she, no glamour, huh? no, not a bit. I just that look on her face. But I'm done. No, you're not yeah. done. This is going to yeah, take. Yeah, we five just hours. started. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, that's that's really great. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you've done you know good for yourself with this project and good for others, which is just sort of the theme of this whole podcast. Well, um, yeah, it's been. Um, the response I've been getting emails at the site, at the you know the website for the doc, and mm -hmm. two of them actually really touched me. One was a man who was starting cancer treatment the next day after he'd seen a screening, and he said, uh, "After I watched your documentary, I realized I have no choice but to beat this." And um, mm -hmm. that you know, I mean, that brings tears to my eyes thinking about it. Uh, another person wrote and said. I got dragged to a screening of your documentary and I didn't want to watch a bunch of older people run. And by the way, I'm 62. And after watching your documentary one month ago, I have now started running every single day. Oh, wow. And she said, you have this, this, this movie has changed my life. Oh, my and, goodness. um, yeah, it's, it, you know, you read things like this and, Every single time when I think about Arizona emissions <laughs> or errors and omissions insurance and all of the, you know, uh, everything about all that, it just, it all disappears because I think, okay, this was, this was, uh, this was important. Oh my goodness. Oh, it's, it's, it's just, uh, lovely to hear the passion in your voice and the excitement and the pride. Well, this piece of work. you know, I, the people that I found, like I have an 80 year old running a half marathon for her 80th birthday. And, um, and she is so emphatic about how much running means to her. And I have, you know, a Catherine was 70 in my doc when she was mm -hmm. running the New York city marathon, by the way, she finished faster than I did. And, yeah. uh, at 70 and, so you see these people and it gives you so much hope and optimism for your own future. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's changed me. So I, uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to have met them because they've been important parts in my, of my life. I bet you got to know them pretty well if you're in the training arena with them and going through the process. We text a lot. I actually write with all my runners a lot and um, we've gotten to be very good friends and mm -hmm. they're all very, thank God, they're happy with how the movie turned out and mm -hmm. um, they're happy to be seen and they're happy that people know what they're capable of doing. And one of them, Helene, says in the documentary that her biggest hope is that people watch her and say that if she can do all of that, what more can I be doing? And I think that's the main message of the documentary. It's not that you have to go out and run tremendous distances, like I said, but if you see an 80 year old running a half marathon, you can walk around the block, most likely, <laughs> you know, you can, right. you can take the stairs instead of right. the elevator. So it's about small right. incremental changes that add up to right. a big life change. 
That's really, really vitally important. Where can people find your documentary, Liz? Well, it is available on Amazon. Uh, okay. That's a very good place to find it. It's available on iTunes, which is another oh. good place. Um, okay. Anybody can visit thehumanrace.net, and okay. that lists all of the 26 places it can be found. Um, I also have a human race page on Facebook and a human okay. race Twitter. Uh, but the easiest places to find it, I would say, right off the top of my head, are Amazon and iTunes. And then do you have your own Facebook page where people might be able to interact with you? Uh, I do. I do. It's under Elizabeth Vassie um, okay. because one strange thing about being an actor is sometimes people take your name and run with it. So oh. uh, there were several Liz Vassie pages set up that uh, weren't, oh. weren't me. Um, so I am Elizabeth Vassie on Facebook, but I also have a human race page that I, I look at very frequently and answer people there too. Oh, great, great. Because it sounds like people do have questions or they do have feedback they'd like to share with you. Yeah, they're welcome to it. I, I'm. Uh, there's also uh, something on the website on the human race dot net. There mm -hmm. is a little icon. You can email me and oh, um, we can great. communicate that way. I am infinitely findable. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sounds great. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to share this this project and it uh, it just sounds so i mean as you know i've 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 seen it and it's it really is inspiring uh i stayed up well past my bedtime to finish it and uh super inspiring just really heartwarming and thank you for sharing all uh, all your experience with us today. thank you so much very happy to be here Thank you so much for joining us on Zestful Aging. If you like the podcast, please share it with some of your friends. I love to hear from my listeners. Send me an email at nicolechristina.com. In this phase of our lives, we're more aware that our time is precious, and we certainly don't want to waste it taking care of stuff that we no longer need, left over from a life that we are no longer living. We know we would feel better with less clutter and more open space, but we don't know how to get there. If this sounds familiar, I'd love you to check out the online course I've developed with professional organizer and designer, Carrie Luteran. This course is different than others you may have tried because we give you clear steps to deal with the clutter and tools to help you face the overwhelm and feelings that come up when you're going through your clutter. It's practical and realistic, and the lessons are short and punchy and very manageable, but it has the power to change your life. We all deserve to live in a peaceful home without the chaos of too much stuff. Find out more at NicoleChristina.com. And next week, we're going to be speaking with Action Nan. She's a 72-year-old innkeeper in Cornwall, UK, who has dedicated her life to eliminating single-use plastic. And she spends her weekends cleaning up beaches. She's vowed to clean up a beach every single weekend in the entire year. And you will find her with her tribe of litter pickers on the beaches. She is something else. You will really enjoy this interview. See you then.